Excellent, excellent. Are we uh, are we rolling? Are we rolling online? Um, in which pay, in which case people yeah, we're are like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So people are getting a heck of an awful shot there, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit frightening for everybody, wasn't it? Oh dear, I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid the worldwide feed is just uh, has just cut. Keith, were you ready? I mean, well, we'll put you there. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, guys. I am. Um, uh, and welcome back for our final session, and, and I know most of you were with us yesterday, and I thought that question and answer session was just such a glorious couple of hours. It just helps me to run it and keep it tight. And I'm, I'm going to stress again that, you know, I'm no expert on this, so this is your opportunity. The amount of knowledge and experience and enthusiasm and passion for futsal in this room is absolutely extraordinary. So. If you feel like it and there's no pressure, please do contribute. Um, it is a question and answer session. I want to get it underway in a minute, but actually, one more little story. It's not little to the gentleman involved, but uh, one more story I'd like to tell you. Uh, Dragomir, would you like to come forward, please? Would you give Dragomir a big welcome, please? Um, that one. Um, Dragomir, just tell us a little bit about where you're from and your story, please, because I know you're quite passionate to do this. Would you like to tell the group, please? Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for uh, this opportunity. I'm from the Republic of Moldova. I'm a founder and owner of uh, Futsal Club Victoria Buykain. So we have uh, three years of activity. We are uh, a young, young club. And uh, for uh, next season, uh, we decided to uh, announced here at the Futsal Focus Conference, our official partner, that is a social and charity uh, platform. It's a first crowdfunding platform from the Republic of Moldova. And I bring it uh, to puzzles from Moldova and we put together. Oh, I see, right, you've got some, you've got, oh, you've got props. <laughs> With you. Do you want me to hold one? Was Moldova the country that Michael Craig came from in Dallas or Dynasty or something like that, wasn't it? No? I'm very old and nobody else can remember that program. You can't think, so don't give me that hand. Oh, it's a, I get it, it's a photo. Sorry, the, the, that puzzle was annoying me and I, I, I So the, the point you're trying to make is your your, your futsal program is is very much socially based. You're you you're, you're doing your bit for the community. You're using yeah. you're using futsal as, as a community function to try and help people. So uh, we deliver the uh, the futsal to the people through a social platform, and they will know more about what is futsal, what we do what we promote, what values we promote, and uh, so we can promote the social needs of this platform to others. So this is a, um, a financial method to raise funds, funds from friends, from families, via network friends, via people, and uh, it's an opportunity for small clubs to follow us and our uh, example of crowdfunding. And uh, I will talk to, uh, tell you about uh, the name of crowdfunding platform. It's um, so a group of Moldovan people from abroad and from our country. Uh, they made uh, this platform is the name of uh, so our politics, and they do that politics don't. So explain that to me again. So. Um, the politics don't uh, do charities. Okay, no, no. Oh, yeah. so and uh, the name of platform is yes. the name of political uh, governing body from Moldova. So we it's uh, Govern 24 uh, because it uh, works 24 hours. I'm um, with you. <laughs> but you, what you're basically saying is there's no government assistance. You've got to, you've got to take these things into your own hands. Yes. Yeah, we've got it in that direction. <laughs> 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 
but uh, and I hope the government of the UK are watching and here being disgraced on this futsal thing. Do you reckon, I mean, I, I, I wanted to get, I, you know, the, the, the thing about this room is we have got futsal being used on all levels from, from giant billionaires in the States through to projects like the one that Dragomir is involved with and, and I just wanted to get him up and give him a few minutes just to explain to you all a different perspective on it. So, uh, long way to be here, not in his native country, but doing great work and using futsal to undermine it. So, That to the person, uh, the person I'm trusting to be the most responsible for the next couple of minutes. Um, listen, as I say, this is your panel. Please jump in. I'll get the, the, the job started, but then we'll just see where this this, this goes. Uh, central theme, I guess, for the start of this at least, is futsal in England, and you know how we push it further and establish it a wee bit more. Mark Palias is obviously the uh, former. Chief Exec or Chairman? I've lost my balance. Chair. Well, I mean, well, no, I know. I interviewed you a number of times. But Chief Exec, let, let's be honest, there were so many of you for a period. I, I, uh, oh, 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 there was a lot of yeah. There was a, obviously Tran there, and we're grateful. Oh, yeah, of course. And well, we're grateful for a patronage at this particular conference. Hell. Um, Jess George is uh, Director of Football at Cambridge United. Chief Executive? Right, I'm doing well, aren't I? Do you know what I was trying to do this without looking at my pad? Uh, Michael Schubler, are you Futsal Technical Director for the FA in England National Futsal Head Coach? No. <laughs> okay, right. Um, I thought, I, thought, I thought under the circumstances I had a good couple of days, but in hindsight it's not finishingly brilliantly well, is it? Mark Dick, would I be right in saying that you are the Futsal Development Manager for the English Football League Trust. That is cool. yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, well representing the women's game and England national futsal deaf team uh, head coach Luciana Silva. There we go, you see. We got there in the end. Um, one thing that came to me during Al's talk, is a, which is the sort of starting point I, I, I'd like to go with on this, um, particularly in the development stages, we get told with the 11 aside game. Jess George, um, that it's not about winning, it's about taking part, it's about honing skills. With futsal in the younger age groups, does it make it easier to let them win and then, or to attempt to win and therefore appease the need in the parents that we've been trying to suppress? I think um, youth development is about educating parents as much as it is educating kids. I think kids want to win, full stop. You don't need to create competition. Kids want to win. I think it's up to the adults to make sure that at the right age in youth development that becomes a priority or not. So I think, you know, when you look at 11 aside football as um, players progress nearer to the first team, um, players have to learn how to win, otherwise they never get their opportunity in the first team and they never are ready for that opportunity. In early years of football, I don't know, when I watch certainly 11 or small sided games at academy level, you've got no idea what the score is because there's so many goals and that's what you want. You just want to encourage individualism and you want to encourage kids to go out and express themselves. So I, I think futsal, um, to be honest, is just, I sit here as the least qualified or experienced futsal person in the room, but from a club that um, embraces futsal as an opportunity for young players to develop and be a part of the development <coughs> of their academy and also then to create a different pathway for boys and girls that are more um, suited to that game and it's an outcome for them rather than just football being the outcome. But I, I see it's pretty simple, like you've got to get people involved who love it first and then you hone skills and you develop people and you let them have the opportunity to express themselves. And I, I don't think we have to get too worried about is it competitive, do we care about the scores, because kids want to win anyway. So I just think it's up to us to create an environment where kids can express themselves, develop, and enjoy themselves. Thoughts? <laughs> um, I agree. The, um, so my experience of working with kids is that if you know, they win or lose, so if they, they win or lose, they're in the car on the way home. They're, they're asking about the chicken nuggets when they get home, and they're asking about the chips. You know, but the parent is the one that 
gets caught up in all that winning and losing. But is winning important? Well, I think it's important. And I think all of us, when we go out to do our best, we want to win. So I think it's more about how you hone the environment for that child, that athlete. Um, even at the elite level, you know, it's, it's about winning, but you still need development and you still need to correct, progress people. And the most important thing, I think, in, in all of it is, you know, what Jess said is about learning. You know, every person in the world that I've ever met that wants to get better and wants to learn, and winning is part of that. Luciana, the point I was uh, making, oh, that's a passion microphone there. The, the, the point I was making was it's such a fast, exciting game, there's an appeasement for the parents who need to see that all energy, whereas in the 11 aside, if we say, well, it, you know, what's most important is for little Johnny to stay at left back and, and hold his left foot, that doesn't necessarily, you know, give them the buzz they're looking for. I think there's still like the tactical aspects so the parents might have to say, oh, uh, if they're watching the game, it might be that they put pressure on the children to say, why didn't you pass the ball, why didn't you shoot, for example. But I think the most important thing, like Mike said, is all the learning. And one thing is if you teach the children or if you teach the athletes to play only in one certain way, they're not going to be able to adapt. If the parents are telling them to do one thing all the time, they're not going to be able to adapt. So as coaches, I think our goal is really to teach them or create that environment for them to learn different ways of playing. And then depending on the game, depending on the environment, they, they will adapt their game and they will make their decision as well. Um, can we pass the microphone on to Mark, please? Can we talk about um, futsal um, and where there are established? Oh, I should speak in the mic for the benefit of those who there. Whether whether uh, whether our established five-a-side industry has has well, it clearly has curtailed the growth of futsal in this country. Anecdotally, I'd say yes. Uh, the five side industry here, um, when I was at the FA, one of the things that um, Mike and I were talking about this is how do you persuade the FA to get behind futsal? Uh, one of the debates at the time was the small side of game that had been hijacked by private enterprise. And, and, and to an American, that might not seem the, the wrong thing to do, but to the FA, it was suddenly the fact the small side of game was being run by entrepreneurs who were a bit pits and people like that who were. Um, jumping up all over the place. I think this is another example whereby they're given another chance. This is another example where you have a growing sport. I think it's a fast and vibrant version of the game. Whatever merits it has as a football development tool, pass that to one side. If you just look at where the FA comes from, they're supposed to regulate all variants of football that you see. And the small side of the game is one of the ones where they think they missed the boat. I think they missed the boat at the time. Uh, and this is another opportunity now. If you're looking at the FA, um, it, it moves fairly slowly, like a lot of institutions do. Um, and, and I think that what has to happen for those people who want to get FA backing, I think you have to say, look, um, here's another opportunity to look after and take the small side of game. Then you will get the, uh, the support that you need. Uh, but that's a very, very hard ask because, of course, the retention is very much focused on, on, on the development side of game. Michael, what, what, what remit have you been given? What has Martin Glenn said to you? Yeah, so I think, I think the first stage is that um, there is a appreciation there that, that futsal is growing. You know, we know that. I think that's why I'm in the job, <laughs> you know, in all reality. So, you know, I'm the, the first person in, if you like, that is purely looking at futsal top to bottom. So the first stage is for me to um, sit down, assess what's going on um, around the landscape, how it's looking in, in the different pockets, and I think. You know, sometimes futsal has been growing organically in different silos, but it has been growing. Um, and, and now it's about trying to write a strategy that I can take back internally, uh, consultation with different people to try and get a strategy for, for futsal, which is, which is a really big move, because we've never had somebody, you know, at the normal age go, what is your strategy for futsal? And I suppose my reason is to try and table a strategy, get a strategy through, and then start to lead from an organisation point of view of what we believe uh, futsal needs or should look like, but I think it's pro probably quite clear that you know from this weekend, which has been great. You know, the sport needs collaboration. You know, there's no doubt about it. And successful sport needs collaboration. It needs different partners. It needs different delivery agents. It needs all things that are going to make the sport work. And I see the FA as since I've been in, which is you know five months, is that we should lay the roads, and lay the paths for all the different organisations to be able to hang on. And I think you know Mark's made a clear point about the governance around it. 
is really crucial with, with gut health for me and, and what that looks like for the future. Martin, we haven't heard from, from you. I mean, you know, there's clear benefits. So why has it been so difficult to achieve, to achieve a, a more general role? You're in and around, I'm assuming, lots of EFL clubs. Yeah, so my role also with the EFL Trust been in post for just over two years. The EFL Trust runs a games programme, a competition for up 16 to 19 year olds. Um, that has rolled out pretty well. So we've got 37 clubs involved, over 114 teams. We're looking at 1,000 16, 19 year olds involved in the programme, playing futsal every week, every fortnight. A thousand. Every season. A thousand 16, 19 year olds playing futsal every week. Um, of them, just over 100 have been girls, that's numbers from last year. So it is out there, as, as, as Michael said, it's, it's there. It's probably not out there in the world, in, 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 uh, everyone aware of it. It's kind of done and hidden. And I think that's the next bit that, that needs to be brought out so everyone's aware of what's going on. And the, and the work that's going on by people in the room, I think clubs that aren't here as well, that, that, that do a good job. We, you, you see no, I was just, just going to say that um, I went to a football league trust meeting just after we got promoted back into the league, so that was three and a bit years ago. Um, and a young man stood at the front who was part of a program, um, part of that 16 to 19 year old program, and was very, very impressive. Spoke with real passion about the game. Um, it's, I, I didn't honestly know what it was until that moment. Um, we were back and um, we introduced it to our clubs. So I think explaining to clubs what it is and getting clubs at a certain level to understand what it is and to get people speaking about it who are really passionate is really important. And my only observation though, and I don't know whether you'd agree with this, is that I've watched quite a number of games with our first team and I'll watch a group that have played football for a long time and a coach from uh, a guy who's a real technical coach. And then I'll watch our 16 to 18 to train, or sorry, play, who have only just started playing and it looks nothing like the game. It looks like a five-a-side game with a football ball. And I think that's a real challenge is to get kids playing it at a much younger age. I understand the need to do it at 16 to 18 and it fills a, an education program and therefore it's really attractive to clubs. But I think for clubs who run that program, they have to create something underneath that to make that a, a long term vision for the club and to give kids an opportunity to really develop in the sport. So once five sides ingrained, very difficult to bring them back. Would you agree in the room? Once, once people have played traditional English five-a-side, difficult to start to steer them to futsal once they become that bit more mature. Am I right? Am I wrong? Yeah? Yeah. I just think you've never, in a development program, had someone playing football just at 16. So if you can embed that in them at a young age, then they become futsal players rather than playing futsal. Yeah. Big, big difference. Panelists, can I just say this? This is not an interview. Don't wait. Don't don't wait for me to ask you. If you want to speak, look at me. Grab a mic. Just speak and join in. So please go for it. Like Mark's just stop. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, if if you look at football coaching, I, then you're really talking about a specific coaching. Then you might say, well, yes, we've known this for a long time, but but actually, certainly when I was first at down and looking at this area. We didn't do it in this country, we brought it across from the continent. I'm very specific coaching in South Island, and that is that you have to fit in skills at a certain age, you have to put the building blocks in place. So, if you're now coming back to futsal, why does futsal work for me looking at it as a football development tool? If you do an age specific coaching, you're looking at moving from constant practice into variable practice and random practice, and that's a, that's a, a posh way of saying you start playing a game because you're making the decisions you're going to make in a game. Now why futsal works for me to some extent is not only the efficiency and the volume of touches that you get, but it's the quality. So what you're trying to achieve when you're coaching sessions in football, you're giving it but in a fun situation. And again you come back to the essential principle about um, age specific coaching is you build all the building blocks. You know by the time you get to 16 with all due respect to the EFL, the bus has left the bus stop. And you know, in China we have an issue. And um, they want us to set up an academy and it'll start 16 year olds. Well, you know, I'm not just building a futsal academy, I'm building a football academy. But the same principle applies. But if they judge in five years' time the output from those kids at 21, it ain't gonna be massively different to what they would have got otherwise. So, you know, I call that a booby trap and we're actually trying to get down younger and younger and younger. 
And so God, honestly, one of the developers born in this country, that's where you go, you go to the schools when you get young. And, and you will see, and that's why I was interested in bringing it to this country rather than building St. George's. Because if I'd done that, and I would have got out of the, if I'd laid a map of futsal across the population, I would have got the bedrock of a lot of players coming out with natural skills, played in a natural way, and getting the volume that you want of quality touches, etc., etc. I'd also argue we'd have settled the issue with the parents, because some of the worst lessons I got at the FA were related to the parents. And actually, it's not just the parents you want to deal with, it's the coaches. Because the coaches in the current EFPP system actually want to win their particular contest. And the temptation, again, when you go into age specific coaching, is the coaches will get there and they'll pick the big lads, age 13, who will win the games if you play a physical game. And it will, it will militate against the, the more technically gifted players and the smaller players. So, in so many ways, so delivers as a football development tool. But principally, you know, you, you can't avoid the fact that age-specific coaching is the way that modern coaching is going anyway. And so futsal at an early age is massive. Were you, sorry, were you agreeing or disagreeing? I, I just and only disagree with the EPPP and academies, because I think it's like anything, you get good coaches, good clubs, and you get bad coaches for better. Just some of our overseas guests have, please. Okay, know. so EPPP is the um, way in which all the academies are graded and have status and get their funding and are licensed by the FA. Um, and the Premier League are really funded by the Premier League, so lots of rules. But like anything, Mark's right, there'll be situations where you go and watch and the 13s are big strong players whacking at the length of the pitch, but there'll be good clubs who do it right and understand that development is about looking at it long term. And I think that's, that's the key for me with futsal is, um, so at our club, um, we've done it the wrong way around, but we had a senior team and then realised that if that wants to have any longevity or any future, we have to embed it from the very youngest age. So therefore we have a development program from the very youngest all the way through to 16, because then we can hopefully develop better quality players to go into a scholarship program so that that futsal scholarship program has got a purpose rather than it just being filling some places in a college scheme, sometimes for funding. Um, so there's a reason to do that, and then a development team to supplement the first team. And then long term, I think that at six, seven, eight years old, I, I don't think any kid goes into playing a sport knowing that that's going to be the outcome. I think you have to give them opportunities. And it's futsal, like Mark said, it's a great learning tool to develop talented young footballers because it's such a technical game. And at some point in the future, it might be that that's a more appropriate game. We've got a young lad who, who um, Michael knows, who's involved with one of the England age group um, groups, who started with us as an eight-year-old in our academy, got through growth, pitch has got a little bit big, the game didn't suit him as well, and the outcome for him is he's a fantastic futsal player, representing our club at 18 years old and playing in the Super League this year. So I think lots of outcomes is what football clubs have a responsibility to give youngsters. On, on the development in terms of, of girls football so there are lots of initiatives in England but I think the main issue when I spoke to the um, league managers as well for the women's teams one of the main things is it's not all connected so for example Gloucestershire FA where I come from uh, we have every January and February we run a league a winter league so they stop football they play futsal from under 8 to under 18 so we have over 200 girls doing that every year that lasts five weeks but what comes before that what comes after that how does it link to schools how does it link to colleges how does it link to universities where's the pathway and i think that's that's one of the main challenge that we face and so if we can get everyone together so 16 to 19 university then we can all build something really special i think wow. yeah, um, yeah that's one of the challenges we put in place with the efl trust and the clubs that are also involved so the majority of them have a 16-19 programme, and as Jess said, that's part of it. There's lots of clubs like Cambridge, like Chanmere, and Bristol, Peterborough, Grimsby, that do lots of junior sections as well, because that is a pathway to engage with futsal earlier. So it's kind of gone to top down the bottom approach because they realise actually we need to have age specific coaching, but actually, well, it's just it, we need even futsal earlier because we can't convert them later on. The coaches have gone now from seeing futsal as participation and engagement to actually now it's actually development that they can work with players and make them better which links into the clubs in the great schemes of what they want to achieve um, but also that it gives them like, coaches a pathway to work with players whilst we've got roles for coaches 
at younger age groups. Um, clubs are pretty good at managing what they're doing themselves in their own area. They understand the hotspots of what's going on and the local communities. So some clubs are very, very proactive in having their own local leagues. We've tried to coordinate that, having under 16 leagues, and hopefully we've got a competition, sorry, for a sports competition. And we're hoping that'll go down lower as well, so there's more national competitions that are run at a lower level, at younger ages where you can get involved. So I think the challenge in our though is probably consensus with everyone in the room is that it is fragmented. We need support from each other, so it's collaboration with the FA, coach education, but also then working out venues where we can play this and make sure we get access to it at the right times, and then it's the referees as well supporting them to make sure that the games play at the right level and give a great experience to all the players that are very involved. So before I move it on, which is something's niggling away at me, you get a figure of a thousand. So just call a thousand what again at least? So it's a thousand, as of last season, there's a thousand players playing futsal in the 16 to 19 EFL Trust Futsal League. In the EFL Trust League. Do we have figures, Michael, for the whole country? Because I was absolutely bricking myself. That was the entire amount of 16 to <laughs> yeah, 19 no. year olds <laughs> playing futsal in the country. So, so one of the organic growth is the um, capturing it. So one of the challenges that I've had coming in uh, for a few months is how do we capture this? How do we capture the growth of football that's going on? Um, which sounds simple, which sounds easy, which sounds not a problem, but actually if it's not embedded with certain structures that becomes quite complicated. Um, so the growth and the other thing is people are playing in a football environment, people are playing in a football environment with the EFL, people are playing in an education environment, people are playing in it in a youth league environment where they're coming indoors on a winter break. So the numbers are looking like around 50 to 60,000 players now touching futsal. Touching futsal. Of all age groups. Of under 18. Of under 18. Of under 18. So, so I can't hang my hat on and say that is exactly it, but, what I'm, but we do know that people touching futsal more than we think. So now the challenge we have is, that I believe is, one, what's the identity of that? Is it futsal? Are they touching futsal or are they touching a form that people are calling futsal? Okay. The other challenge with that is, what does the coaching look like? You know, what does the experience of those kids, what does the experience for the delivery arms look like? Is it a commercial provider delivering? Is it a cameo bay delivering? Is it a, a club that's delivering that? So the silo that's growth and that's been going on is, is I think in the last two, three, four years is huge. And I, I genuinely believe that it's come from a couple of areas. One is um, digital engagement. So one is the fact that kids can now, millennials, go on the internet and quickly see Ricardinho, quickly see the Euros, quickly see those different concepts and go, ah, I want to go at that. And, and I think Jez makes a really important point for me that futsal, let's be quite clear, futsal is for all. Football is for all. Rugby is for all. You know, sports, kids should choose what they want to do. And then what our job is as futsal is to hook them in. And there's a lot of evidence that says if we get them pre-8, which is probably the bit that we're missing in futsal, if we get them pre-8, we'll keep them. Sorry, I just... 60,000 did you say? Roughly. Roughly 60,000. Stephen, the whole of, of England, that's England, not the UK. England. England. Players of futsal in the whole of England, regardless of age groups. You got? Do you have a rough thing with your website? No, but I, I've been trying to find out, and like, like Michael was saying, that's a difficult one to find out. Right. Our, and especially UK wide, but that is something that will eventually come. Okay, Keith, what are, you, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, it's very interesting because I think England and the United States are in parallel paths uh, after hearing you about the players playing in what age group, because in my country everybody's arguing about what age should they be playing and that issue that we have with parents in the sidelines. So to totally two different issues. And I won't talk about the parents because we don't have enough time to talk about that. But <laughs> I've always wanted to say this, that in your country, you invented golf. You ever watch a 16-year-old swim a golf club for the first time? You ever watch a three, four, five, and six-year-old swim a golf club for the first time? The four, five, and six-year-old who swings the golf club for the first time, the swing is very fluid. The 14, 15, and six-year-old who swings the golf club for the first time, it's very rigid. They're, they're not past the stage, but they learn a different motor skill in a different way. So what we're trying to push in the United States is three, four, five, and six-year-olds should be on a futsal court. 
I'm not saying that 15, 16, and 17s are too late, but sometimes they're too late in order to grasp the game of futsal. So, in, in my belief, in our belief, it's the, the little kids that we're trying to grasp because the older kids are, are already moving up. And Jess, you said that, and I totally agree with you. And so, yeah, please, go on. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to grab that microphone, Jess? So, Antonio, yeah. have you got a figure in Portugal? Are oh, uh, 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 futsal players under the age of 18? No, I, I, I don't have that. I have the aggregate. Okay, I'm putting you all on the screen. Yeah, no, the aggregate. No, I've got the aggregate. It's about 32,000 at the moment. But they're, they're enrolled on the FA. Uh, playing futsal at the moment. That's the, the graph that I showed you today. Okay. They're about 32,000. <coughs> Can I go back to this uh, the, um, uh, aspect about futsal and, and football and where, when do they should start? I mean, they're, they're different sports. I think everybody thinks the same. They're different sports, they've got different rules, they've got different coaching approaches. Uh, now, uh, the, but, but they can coexist, I think. They can coexist, I don't know uh, until when, until which, which age group, but there are some competencies, competencies that the, the kids can by playing football earlier on. And then they go on, they, 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 they can choose later on whether they go to football or, to, or carry on on futsal. I mean, at some they have futsal at school, uh, the primary scheme in the primary schools, and now in the secondary schools there is futsal. Uh, at the, the PEs, uh, they, they have futsal passes. But, uh, and then they have an, already an idea. Uh, but the problem is, uh, even so, and even in, the, in, the, in the, how futsal has been developed, in, Portugal, uh, clubs are not, the big clubs are not doing it. The big clubs are not doing it. They're not using the futsal at the beginning at their, club, at their, at their football, at their football uh, 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 young age groups because the, the pressure is to win. You know, the big clubs want to win and quickly and they don't pay much attention to, to how things need to be developed. Uh, so that's a challenge. Uh, uh, Braga's coach has been talking about this for, for years now uh, on the relevancy of having uh, futsal at, at youth uh, age groups, uh, uh, playing futsal at the beginning and then go on and decide what they do. But it's, 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 it's not implemented, it's not, it's, not, it's not working at home still. Uh, we all think it's good and the futsal in Portugal has been developed uh, uh, a lot. But it uh, hasn't even reached that point yet. Right, sorry, just to explain to our, to our new panellists, uh, Antonio is involved with Sporting Club uh, Braga, who, and, and yeah. hmm. sorry, is it that one? Yeah. Is it the battery? Could we get that to the Thank you very much, that's brilliant. Um, and, um, the Portuguese FA basically in 2011 really started to back futsal and they've had an absolute darn great whoosh. What were you going to say, Jess? Sorry, I was just going to come back to your point about um, starting at a young age, which I, obviously that, that's correct, but I think kids to be inspired to play need aspiration. Um, and that's why I think it's really important that if you're going to create something from scratch, you need to get them what good looks like and something to really aspire to. So we, we did it, we were really lucky at our club. Um, doesn't often happen in football. We, we got a lad who had been at Man United when he was younger, a, a, a lad called Luke Chadwick, um, one or two knew him at the front here, who wanted to come back and play for Cambridge United and help us get back into the Football League and he did that. And then he retired. So we actually got him to play for our futsal team for a year and become almost like the face of futsal at our club. So when we launched it, it was all about Luke Chadwick. He went into schools, he developed that with the younger kids. So everybody had, it was like a high profile guy that even if anybody didn't know futsal, if Luke Chadwick was playing it and was talking about it, they would be interested in it. So I think, you know, participation is huge. Then you need pathways, but you need an aspiration. And I think when you're trying to build participation really quickly and you're trying to create something that would take 10 years to become as good as it can be for a kid who starts playing at six, seven years old. To create that, you need some aspiration and you need something. And I think that's where, you know, the work with the Super League and then the England national team, certainly for our couple of young players involved in our team, to go and go to a regional centre or to go and train with the national team um, is a huge inspiration for them. And then in turn, they inspire a lot of younger kids to, to play the sport for the first time. I agree. I, I just 
On the Antonio's point, I think the numbers thing around 35,000 that Antonio's talking about is futsal specific players coming through the youth system with academies and SC Brasley. Ah, but he's talking yeah. about a population that's nowhere near our. No, 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 no what, what I'm talking about is what I'm talking about is um, organic futsal with football clubs, twin track and athletes uh, going on in commercial providers. The, we don't have the academy structure within futsal clubs in that pathway. He's talking about his futsal players in a specific futsal pathway. I'm talking about futsal and football, the numbers together. So push, the numbers are nowhere near in our, you know, Super League clubs, you know, now 35,000, they play Portugal as a sport. Yes, I get you. Reckon? On a population of 12, 15, what, what have we got in Portugal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 million. 10 million. We've got what in England now? 55 million? Is it 55? No, like England, not, not UK. Is it 60 million? Still about 60 million. 60 million in England, England alone. Mm. So I suppose on that point, so I just think that's where you know this this weekend's been great because I think to grow futsal, we need to do futsal for futsal for football. Yeah, and I think what we've done probably in the last 10 years as a football community and a big football culture is we've tried to shortcut that jump. Now I'm not saying that. That, that means that futsal can't have its own identity, you know, so cricket have worked that identity out, um, other smaller sports, rugby have worked that, that, that identity out, and I think we are in a stage, and personally, where it could be quite special, um, and, I, and actually, if we get right, and it has to be collaborative, it has to be with the Super League club, it has to be with the FA, it has to be with the, if you know, the finance structures that everybody's talking about this weekend, it, it can't be just the front-end coaching that has to be right, it has to be all the back-end offices and the back end structures to, to put cell to, to actually drive and go. We've, we've, you know, we've discussed those over, over this weekend. Alison, just to the benefit of uh, our new panellists, would you just tell us where you're from and what your interest in the futsal is today as well? Um, Alison Palmer, I work with a number of different uh, companies, Worthing Town FC, Worthing FC, London United, uh, Futsal Club and Futsal Academy. Um, we're talking about aspiration. I think it's a brilliant moment just to focus in on that in terms of if we can't see it, we can't be it without sounding too corny. I think the girls and the women's league could be very, very vital to the growth of futsal. In terms of aspiration, we need to be able to see an England national women's team. Um, speaking yesterday, there were some really good reasons why we're not there yet that Michael's explaining. I think it would be a good time just to address that aspiration and how, where we're up to with the England women's futsal team and how that's going to come about, if we could. Yeah, I'll just start and then I'll pass it to Mike. <laughs> uh, in terms of aspiration, I think you touched upon, uh, touched upon a key thing. I've worked with some players who are passionate about futsal and they're Welsh players and they're English players, so they're not players who grew up playing futsal. But there, was, there is something missing, which is the opportunity to say, you know what, I'm going to become an England player. I'm going to be. I'm going to play for Wales. Um, so some of the, those players might come to a point where they will give up. Some of the players will persevere. One example is well, some of your futsal focus covered Alice Evans. So one of uh, my goalkeepers was the captain. She was the first player to actually go and play professionally in, in Italy. And that came about because they needed a goalkeeper. I knew someone from the club. She's the captain. My only goalkeeper. Go. They contacted me on a Monday. On Thursday, she flew to Italy, and that was it. So those opportunities, I, the way I came to England was, I had an opportunity to play at the time of football. So that, to me, that's my passion about futsal because I want players to have the opportunity as well. But again, so that's an aspiration. You could play somewhere else, be a player, a professional player. And the other side of it is the England team. So I coach the England deaf team. So we do take by European the, um, world champs. But of course, you have to be eligible to play. So those players are not eligible to play for, for the deck team. Um, I know that the FA is doing is now starting to support the women's national leagues for the first time. So Gareth, who is in the audience here, can we put your hand up, Gareth? Yeah. So Gareth worked quite hard uh, the last two years trying to build a national league. So we had a national league two years ago. We decided to have a central venue, and some. <coughs> Teams found it really hard to actually charge that central venue. Whereas now we then moved to a more kind of away and home games, we worked better, and now the FA 
is starting to support with some uh, money or in finding venues that we can have North, Midlands and South competitions. So there is the support there, it's progressing, but as my probably agree, there is some way to go in terms of getting a national team. Um, you know, I don't know what you know, American and things do in terms of the women's national team, but we need a women's team. You know, there's, there's no, I don't think any an FA would ever say any different. We need a women's team in football. I think that's quite clear now. For me, it, I think the first thing people think of, we need to copy the male model. And, and do we need to copy the male model with the women's game? I don't think that's necessarily the case. So I think it's about taking our time. And I think Keith made a really good point about what does your runway look like? What does your, your lead up look like in terms of getting that right? And at the minute, there's a few things that we are not in control of as an FA that we can't you know, compete. So first of all, it's about laying what we believe is right for the FA and for, for our women's game and how that can be linked in with different areas. You know, how can that be linked in with different women's structures? So if you look at the, one of the biggest growth in the women's futsal game is in the university sector, but those players are twin tracking. So they're still playing football. So how do you then correct pathway for futsal within the women's game? Um, or how do you lead that pathway for futsal within the women's game? So I, do we need a women's team? Yes, we do. I think everybody is agreed with that within the football association. But then the other side of it is, you know, the football guys would say this: performance costs money. You know, performance costs money, and that's then about growing the game, the revenue around the game, the business aspects around the game to be able to to be able to sustain that as well. Mark Pallius. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a no brainer as regards the women's game um, for a variety of reasons. Again, when I was at the FA. Uh, 13, no, 13 years ago now. Um, they were trying to cut the budgets and they wanted to cut the budgets for the women's game and I protected that specific. I did that because I've got five daughters and I needed them to do something on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> now, the real reason was strategically, if you looked at it, football, in its arrogance, um, was the major sport in this country. And so when you're looking at it strategically, how do you make it even more of a... a, a um, how can you increase, how can you do better than that? And the answer is quite simple. You just go to that part of the population that's desperately influential, that takes the kids to the games, etc. And, and you just support the game and that. So if you play the game, then naturally you, you, you will actually inculcate it in your kids and, and look at and support that. So the women's game is massively important uh, for, for football generally. It's exactly the same with futsal. Um, with futsal again, I would argue that there's no real, in terms of the physicality, you know, it, it's it's a skill game futsal, and that's something that the women can certainly do. And so I think it's a game that that's, that's, um, that that lays itself open for that. And the other thing I'd say is what one of the things that used to happen when when I was um, looking at this, they'd come up to me and say, well, the women's game football wise would never be able to compete with the men's game, and they made the parallel between um, the Premier League and you know, the women's game. Well, I think they missed the point. That wasn't what it was about at all. It was about some of the points we touched on before, which is about having the aspiration. And, and I'll just tell you very quickly something that, that I was about to present the levels of the Women's Cup final. I'd supported the women's game. Um, and then on the Thursday before the Women's Cup final, I was listening to Radio 4, and there was a woman golfer whose name I can never remember, but a famous one who said, how good was it um, to go and watch? My father took me to go and watch the Ryder Cup, but how much better it would have been if I'd gone to see the Solheim Cup? And I thought, yeah. And on the, on the very Saturday, I was watching the women's game, and my daughter sat me on the shoulder. She's, she's been here yesterday. And she said, Dad, you've got to get us to play football. And uh, they've played that ever since. Now they're playing football, by the way. The point is that, yes, you need aspiration. Yes, you need a, a, a women's England team. Yes, you need a women's competition. No, you shouldn't compare it with you know what you're going to try and do and aspire to with the men. It's just common sense. Thank you. Hold on to that. I'm going to ask you another question in a minute. Oh, it's not. It's not. Oh, sorry. It's not for Mark. Sorry, it's for the other one. It's Mark. 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 I was going to say that. <laughs> so my question is, it's a little bit about my background. I was brought into the YMCA because the YMCA at the time was saying that we can't always just rely upon fund funding 
and then we have to become a little bit more entrepreneurial and we need to start bringing in money through business development so that's what my job was for a while while I, while I lived in Liverpool. Um, a lot of the EFL trusts you know that at the clubs they have different situations some rely upon the club if they carry them some are independent and they have sponsorship or they have you know grants some struggle along a big reason why I was delighted when Eldon said he was going to be here is because you know I think that those trusts you know haven't had work with the community arm of Adrian and had worked with other ones you know aren't entrepreneurial and they're always complaining and stretching their hand out and we want you want give me give me and Eldon's example you know as in being developing a center which brings in money which could actually help a team that's involved with the, the community arm does the EFL trust in any way encourage entrepreneurs? Can, do you think that could be an example you could give to those? You know, trust and say, here's a way that you could develop futsal. Here's a way that you could bring in money to your, your community arm. Here's a, way, here's a really good example of development steps, you know? It's a good question. Um, that's kind of the reason why obviously great you invited us, because it is about extending that, the network of where and what other Providers here in this country or abroad, how they create their own sponsorship to get it in. Um, I think the EFL Trusts, they are quite entrepreneurial in other ways. So obviously now they've grown, it, it, it's not just football that they deliver, um, they are social engagement, they are social inclusion. So they've been really good at capturing quite big contract, if you like, for want of a better word, and funding to get it in that way. Um, what the challenge is to try and entice them to also know that there's a way in futsal as well. Um, but they need inspiration, same as the women do, of where does it go afterwards? So we have a 60 and 9 teams. Then there's a pathway, so some of them have got involved in the England set up at lower levels and the 19s. And that's great, and that's a bit of an incentive. Um, there are the clubs that are out there that are trying to create their own lift, men's lift teams that are into the Super League. Um, and they want to grow it, it's driven by individuals and it's seeing the game grow and I think it's, we're kind of get that cut now, that sort of tipping point of well, the yeah, they'll start to commit to it. Um, there's clubs that are investing in facilities and making their own facilities which include futsal courts and futsal arenas. So I would say they're in a good position to go forward, it's, it's the inspiration of buying of where they go next. And, events like this in the community up there, it's, it's important to share that with the trusts and the clubs. Does so, that, that answer your question? No, I was just saying, what I was asking you is, is that from this conference, you might have seen, especially from Eldon's, you know, presentation, the opportunities there from a centre, you know, he went from one to two, now three. Um, is that something that you could, if we the, the information was passed to, could give to them? Yeah, this is why, so it's, it's on the radar, that's his, if Eldon can give some support, um, after the script, actually, yeah, take, make, take contact. But there's clubs out there that are doing like minded things, maybe not on a grand scale because they haven't had that cultural brought up or playing football experience. Mm -hmm. They have come from a football background. Mm -hmm. well, uh, El, do you, do you feel, bearing in mind what you've achieved in three years, do you feel like screaming at us? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, because um, uh, I'll go back to that phrase that. I've been saying, which is horses for courses. I don't know who said that, by the way. I'm not sure anybody it. did. I think <laughs> we have to. Yeah. Um, but every environment's different until you actually go into the environment and see um, what the culture's like, what the, the people are like. You can really determine it from there. Um, I said in my uh, presentation that a lot of the time I like to sit back and just listen and see see what's going on before you know you can actually react or um, get involved and I think you know you'd need to see like personally I'd need to see the environment a bit more um, I've had an opportunity um, to go to some of the other clubs the last couple of days I've been here had a look at some places obviously uh, Stephen told me about at Futsal who were doing something uh, similar but you know without having a closer look at the models and what people are doing it's really hard, so I, I definitely wouldn't sit here screaming and yelling at anybody going, this is it, this is what you should be doing. Um, 
because it's all, it's, it's all different and I think what Tramley is doing here is very well. You've got the support from, uh, from the club. Uh, if you've got that support from the community and those around you, then you, know, you can achieve anything. Are we expecting too much from our stakeholders? Do we need more entrepreneurs to get hold of this by the balls and really um, get it? Let's be way? honest, that's what Futsal's about. You know, we've been talking about, I don't know how long people have been saying, you know, Futsal should be, should have, would have, could have, but, you know, we're not achieving anything. Sometimes it takes somebody to actually do something a little bit different. Um, and the others will follow, the ones that are successful, obviously people will follow. They'll try and pick up a little something and then they'll, you know, turn it into something even better. So the more people are actually doing something, the more the sport will evolve and the more, you know, other opportunities will arise. You know, PFL is a totally different environment. Um, you know, the FA over here is a totally different environment. You're literally driven by football over here. It's, it's, it's the number one sport, that's, that's all you, you know. You, you can't tell anybody that you've got a product that's better than football. You, you may as well expect, you know, <laughs> the door to be shut in your face and won't be invited in. So I think the English environment has to work with football in some way, shape or form. But in saying that, yeah, some entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs out there can go out and drive something of their own and then hopefully you can meet up at some stage and work together. I think it's great because I think the synergies are like uh, Mark said and I know what saying and the women's game like for, for many years the women's game was compared <laughs> to the men's game and it was because we had such a big football culture with the men's game everybody said oh it doesn't look like it's never going to look like the, men, the men's game but that doesn't mean those athletes aren't elite that doesn't mean those athletes can't go and win a world cup and it's the same with us you know at the minute we're probably in a stage within our country that our football culture first and foremost makes a comparison football and futsal, but actually maybe in a few years time we might start to grow that identity that goes actually we've got three modalities within this country, we've got football, men's football, women's football and we've got futsal uh, and that's part of the, the challenge that, that we have to do together. You know? Yeah, but, but the problem is that you know those football figures, Pelé, Zico, Iniesta, Cristiano Ronaldo, are such an easy marketing tool when you're trying to get people interested in football. Yeah. So, and I think that's really important. And I think um, your people call it your product, your brand, all that. That is really important. And I saw um, when Antonio put his strategy up, a really key thing hit me straight away. They had Cristiano Ronaldo on the front of the strategy. Did Cristiano Ronaldo play football? Yes, he did. So we can't hide from that fact because he did grow up with futsal, so there's no point hiding from that fact. How did he touch it? That's the most important thing. Where did he do it? That's the most important thing. So, you know, in the school system, Cristiano would have to foot, futsal, but then in our school system, we don't have it embedded. So we're already rowing against the tide in terms of not being able to get it into our school system. But that doesn't mean we don't have delivery partners that can go into schools and deliver futsal and, and how we work that. But the really pleasing thing for me was on that, they had a foot cell there alongside Cristiano Ronaldo. And that sounds really simple, message. that sounds really simple to do, doesn't it? But actually that's really important because it's saying Riccardino is the same as Ronaldo, is the same as a women's player, is the same as the, the, you know, the other modes of football. Now in our country, historically, and UEFA the same, you know, FIFA the same, we put Ronaldo and Deco and Messi up on to sell our sport. What we should be doing is getting them to sell our sport alongside our foot sale people. Mm. Yes. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think um, how people get hooked into a sport doesn't matter. You know, so if it's through football, fine. And I think the Tramier have done obviously a fantastic job. We're, we're proud of what we're trying to do at our club, but we're two pretty small clubs in the big scheme of things in professional football in England. And therefore, you look at the bigger clubs and think, you know, there should be more done. Just forgive me 30 seconds, I'll, I'll tell you where, when you talk about entrepreneurship and how you can create things, um, I'll get on, a, on an old hobby horse that, that Mark will be suffering from, hopefully not much longer to get back into the league, but we tried to run and did run an academy at Cambridge United for eight years outside the Football League with zero funding. And it's scandalous, that rule and the rules, because when we're in the conference, we're exactly the same football club as when we're in the Football League. Tramway Roads are exactly the same football clubs they were three years ago, still full-time, still offer opportunities for employment, professional football. 
And now we've got one or two players coming through that if we hadn't fought against those odds and continued our scheme for eight years without that funding, they wouldn't be 17, 18, 19 year olds in our first team because they would have had their academy closed down. And I think from that difficult situation, we just learned that we need to be self-sufficient and self-reliant and forget worrying about the FA and the Football League and the EFL and everyone else because they're brilliant when you're in their club and when you're in their organisation, but when you're not in it, you fall off the end of the earth. So we created our own development programme, we developed, developed our own business that would sustain and be able to fund our academy for that eight years. And a similar project is really what we're doing with futsal. So there is a cost to our first team, there is a cost to being in the Super League, there is a cost to having an academy and a, an excellence programme if you like, but there's a business plan where you can, you don't have to be a genius uh, or a huge entrepreneur to be able to just look beyond, we need money otherwise we can't run this, to actually create a way of generating some income by having huge participation events, having huge tournaments, having lots of different ways where you can, just, you can create enough revenue to sustain uh, an ongoing program. And I think that's really important because if you only do it because you get funding for it, as soon as the funding stops, you stop doing it. And I think you have to, there's a responsibility for professional football clubs with lots of money and lots of resource to do a little bit more for this sport. Yeah, I just, I just going to say, I hit all the debates successfully. You know, at the end of the day, um, you've got to, management is about applying your resources to your priorities. So if you want the FA to do anything with it, you've got to make it a priority for them. The Portuguese FA must have seen it as a priority if they invested in it. That's the biggest difficulty. If we look at the, the biggest organisation that can actually provide a momentum to developing futsal in this country, then you look aside and you say, well, okay, who are the private entrepreneurs will do this and you'll, you'll have it growing fitfully, then you might get the FA to be attracted to it. Because again, as I say, it's 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 um, Groundhog Day. They've lost control of what they would see as a small a very to the small side of the game. The, the point you make, uh, Jesse, is, is entirely right. If you want the football clubs in this country, which I think are a natural network for you, because they are locally engaged and it's not too far a stretch. So yes, uh, from football to, to futsal, etc., etc. That's why we did it. <clears throat> Interesting, by the way, when, when I came here, there were two things I knew would work on the role. One was ladies' football, and one was futsal. As it happens. Um, so you are engaged. You're a different delivery vehicle, mm -hmm. and, and that's for those of you outside of this country. Football is so embedded in the culture that the local football clubs, I'm sure it's the same in, in, in Portugal. Um, you are a delivery vehicle, so you can deliver. Now, if you're talking about getting the local clubs involved, um, I've heard the comment made about where well, the grants go, then, then the activity goes. That is exactly how local football clubs see community. We don't happen to see it that way. So you get a grant, say it's £200,000, you do £200,000 worth of activity. If the grant next year is £100,000, you're Saxon people, you owe £100,000 worth of activity. That is activity without ambition. Activity without ambition. And actually, what we do here is when we look at community, and I spoke to the to the EFL and the community conference when I first arrived and said, look, if you want to really get the attention of your chairman, then tell your chairman this will make a profit. And if you look at community as an example, they have lots of private sector companies delivering services into the public sector. Well, why not us? And that's what we've done. This year we'll make at least £500,000 from the community business that we have. The community business that we have, not the community handout, deliver some stuff. So again, on futsal, I see that exactly the same way. And, and like I said, we have futsal, yes, as a development tool. Yes, actually, in terms of the Super League team, we think we can help to develop it as a sport in some way. But why do we bother doing that? Well, because actually, um, it does a few things for me. One is it makes the club look fairly innovative because nobody else is doing it. We're bringing something new, etc. And that's part of the brand image we want to get. Um, and, and, and the second thing is that um, in, terms of, in terms of making money, I need a market. So I will develop that market. And I will say to the kids here on Merseyside who are football mad, would you like to play for England? And, and Mike will say, yes, you can. <laughs> And actually, having a Super League team and having the latent talent that's around here 
that will be attracted to it, that will shift to it, there will be a focus around it. So there are many ways in which you guys can, can, can use your local football club as a network. But it's difficult because you're going to have to rely on the fact you've got to get the argument back into the FA, which is a massive task. If you call this an industry, that's a real hard one, but actually it can still be done. That's your job. Um, <laughs> The second way is to, yeah, you'll attract entrepreneurs in and partner up with them, etc. But, you know, that's going to be piecemeal. And the third one is use a network that's already here. And I'd argue that's the easiest one. And I, to be honest, one of the things that Nick and I wanted to do when we came here was to change the shape of this club. Part of that was Footstock, so we can then go back. You know, this is my retirement hobby horse, as it were. We can then go back and say to people in the Football League, you know, why don't you follow this blueprint in terms of where you're making a club self-sustainable? Because football clubs aren't necessarily self-sustainable. And that's what we're trying to achieve. This is part of, part of the story. It's not the whole story, but the principles are the same. You know, activity without ambition, forget it. So, so, really, because you said as well that there might have been operators on the, on the five-a-side game uh, that perhaps distorted things and didn't get it quite right. It would be better if it came from a club to set the sort of coaching standards and started their own profit centre as a wheel out, in which case surely that comes from one of the two stakeholders to try and help shape that. Because the chance of getting a collective of entrepreneurs that are going to take the time to refangle five-a-side facilities or to re-educate Presumably, just staying around. Yeah, yeah the, 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 the person who's getting away with this scot free is not the FA. Um, it, because, you know, when we came here, I'll tell you now, Sports England cannot get participation for a lot of the money. I was the director of British Judo. I saw them trying, they get paid for, on, on the basis of participation. They're using public money in this country to generate participation. We came here and we ripped up the tired 3G pitch that was here. It was their generation because they had been put down in three different locations actually. And, and we ripped it up, we put a full style pitch down after a year because we were fed up of chasing the money from Sports England to give us a grant to help us and the conditionality etc to do it. So we didn't do that and if you're watching listen to this. We ripped up that pitch and we put down a full style court which is multi-purpose. So as, as, again, as a chairman of the club, I could use that for wheelchair football. I could use that for any number of things, not just futsal. But I knew and I trusted that futsal could be developed here. And Nikki, how many did we have within three months, was it? Um, we had 100 teams registered in our league, so about 1,000 people a week playing futsal in our 100, 100 teams and about 1,000 a week people. We could give them, what is it, 100,000 hours, incremental, sport I know. and for the football you know the local football county here the weather in this country grows great pitches but it actually pours down in the winter and the kids can't train at nights etc etc they close down the leagues so they were trying to come in here and play futsal so you know sport England if you're listening why don't you put the money into something that we know will work instead of making it ridiculously impossible no channel you haven't spoke for a while I, yeah. having come from Brazil and, and seeing how we operate here is that is is traditional football just simply so entrenched that I don't want to use the phrase swimming against the tide but I, I kind of am it's one hell of a, a, a an effort to try and push futsal into that space that people in this room want it to go into I think the main difference is in Brazil we're not trying to play futsal to help football but that's not the main reason we play futsal because we want to develop futsal and then people become better futsal players and I do understand that because of what the KPIs and what we need to meet in England you do have to have some games for football so we're trying to develop futsal but at the same time we need to make sure you show how football is going to gain something out of them uh, so I think that's the main, the main difference there. And if, you, if I just can touch upon something else, is that in mm, some of the image, that Mike mentioned about image, um, I think we need to take a step back and really think about how we can contribute to change the image of the game as well. So for example, a simple thing, how many women have you seen today? On the videos, on the pictures, how many women have you seen today? Probably two. I remember seeing your presentation and I was like, yes. 
you know, I came to make sure that it's the first thing, and I said, yes. Why? Because you have two people who are going to influence everyone who's here. So people are going to go away now, and we're going to say, well, Keith talked about it. No, oh, Abraham talked about it. Do you know what? It must be a good thing. I, I, sorry about everyone else, I don't know which all the presentations, but that is a key, and I know you talked about it as well, Pablo from uh, Robertus as well. Yeah. So, how do we portray ourselves when we're presenting about futsal? How do we, what kind of things are we using? When you're coaching your players, female players for example, a lot of coaches use male futsal footages. Why? You know, why don't we talk about Tainan Santos, who came and played for us here, and then went to fit the PFL? Why don't we talk about Vanessa, who's been uh, voted the best in the world three times? Why don't we talk about Manda, who's now the best in the world? Why don't we talk about so many players that are the Falcons and Rick Ardenius from the women's futsal? And that's what we need to tell those players, because by the time they start watching those footages, they might aspire to be like them. Gentlemen, Nico, in Croatia, and also you, Pablo, mentioned earlier, in, in you said in Seville, there's a... He's doing it again when he's a fly. <laughs> <laughs> or something. Um, this fly will leave me alone. <laughs> you mentioned in Seville just how entrenched futsal is. You said there's a court on every corner. Mm -hmm. is that, that, and right. is it the same is it in, in the whole of Spain? Is it the same in Croatia? Yeah, I would like to say that futsal is a powerful virus that is spreading well around the world and now also around the England. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves why this virus is so successful. Probably because of its characteristics. So I don't know any other sport that is offering so much in terms of uh, physical aspect, technical aspect, tactical aspect, and decision making or uh, cognitive aspect. If you know any other sport, let me know it. So probably this is the reason why futsal is so successful at this sport. Uh, I think also that uh, connect football in futsal, of course, uh, we are the same family, uh, the same home, but uh, we are also different sports, like uh, Antonio said. Yeah. So uh, I've been uh, you know, speaking to a guy at MNU University. We in England we're looking at it. And what Keith mentioned earlier, futsal has lots of what we call transcendent moments. So all the good things that go on in football, the goals, the shots, the exciting bits, it's condensed into this hotbed of football modality, if you like. The, the, and the other thing is, like Keith mentioned, you can have women, after men, after kids in one hall, you can have a festival around it. And you know, I think our culture is changing in England from our youngsters coming through, they want quick fixes, you know, they want quick iPads with you know the doors, they want all that to be pissed. And I think that Futsal has an opportunity to capture that, that growth and capture that market in that way. So I definitely agree. Pablo, can I just ask you, do you, do you know how Futsal became so uh, entrenched, prevalent? I'm using big words for Spanish to find it, but you know, why is it all over Spain? Why are these, how, how did it happen? What's the history? Do you know? Since you have, since you are born, you are, you are seeing core and you are practicing. I have two doctors, are uh, seven years, fifteen years, and both play football. Not for me. In school, they play. They have court. Football or futsal? Futsal. Futsal, futsal. right? So football also. Yeah. And, uh, but do you remember? It's the... easier to have a court in a, in a school for a size reason. And do you remember them when you were at school? Like it's been, it goes that far back that they've been there for like... Me? Yeah. Yes, of course. All students are playing when you are born, playing futsal. So it's a piece of the jigsaw that we just don't have yet. You know, it is that piece of that jigsaw that we need. And um, we need to somehow get that. And it's really important. And But that doesn't have to be, you know, that doesn't have have to be elite level coaching in that with the kids. So five, six year old kids playing futsal look like five or six year old kids playing futsal, you know, and that's okay. But the, the key fundamentals for that for me is they're not playing five side, they're playing futsal. And what I mean by that is the constraints around the goals, the ball, the surface, the lines, the, the game is futsal. And I think that's a key fundamental difference for us. This, uh, I think that uh, someone of you has said it's the weather here, it's very important. You have 
very popular with her. <laughs> 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 but I'm going to to some people voice places. <laughs> but I like you. Know? And here I have some few arranger on Monday. And it's very important that you can play indoor you know, from all the time in winter is coming here. It's probably it's not in Spain, but even we have the court. But more here that you have this horrible weather. Any thoughts from the room before I start? Yeah, let me just grab a microphone if I can, please. <clears throat> before we start to sort of wind up on the conference. Sorry, where did that hand go up? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Dennis Hines over from the west of Ireland. And uh, I was informed earlier in the week that we get 222 days of rain <laughs> in a year as well. So we're looking to go indoors with football. <laughs> <laughs> but from a federation that has tried and failed to develop the game 10 years ago from top level down, and maybe the more experienced people in the room will remember Simon Clifford and his efforts. The time Janino was, was up in the northeast. That was my first introduction to, to Futsal as a volunteer. Um, so I've seen both sides, the enthusiasm and the energy that comes from being an entrepreneur. And now, fortunately or unfortunately, um, maybe some restrictions that come with trying to get change and development through a federation. But I would go back to two main points. Uh, firstly, Antonio, one of the first things he said was, Things get done in Portugal. Things get done. So I think we all have to find a way to make sure that things get done. Uh, and secondly, very importantly, from a coaching perspective, uh, and I know that I myself have been guilty of it, structured coaching and this idea of a coach and age specific coaching has killed and kills the creativity in a player. Uh, Tuesday night I was in Lansdowne Road, everyone was excited because Wesley Hulham was on the pitch at 35 years of age. It's a crime that he only has 40 caps. We didn't discover him until he was 31. Okay, and when Wesley Hulham got taken off after an hour, 60,000 people were disappointed. And that's what the game of futsal does. So I would stress that if we can develop the game, game great, but the core essence of futsal is chaos, is imagination, is creativity. And, you know, we don't want to be here in, in 30 years' time uh, saying that we have developed all these structures and we have all these programs and all these coaches and we've taken the true essence of the game uh, away from the player. Thank you very much. Final thoughts on, you know, where we go in England with futsal before I get final thoughts on the Congress. Would you like to start, Michael, and pass that down the line, if you would, please? Um, I agree to some degree, um, but I think that if you speak to the Portuguese and the Spanish experts, if you like, that futsal is also highly tactical, you know, really highly tactical at the elite level, and I think sometimes we get confused what's right for the different age groups. So I believe that age group coaching is important with futsal as it is in football. <coughs> because you know you don't throw high level tactics at young kids because they can't do it. And I think sometimes we do that as coaches in futsal. You know, we, we want to give them all the information at the, the wrong age. So, you know, you make what? We were talking about maybe 70, 80 substitutions a game in futsal at the top level. You know, that, that's different to football. So it has its different code. I suppose for me, it's like, it's like two brothers growing up in a house, you know, you grow up together, you fight, you, you get on, but you, you find your way, and then you leave home, and then you go your separate ways, separate pathways, but you've got your own identity, you're your own person, and, and you go and get your own path in life, and I think that's what futsal is with and football. Um, we're just 13, and the bigger brother's like 40, so they've already left, you know, and I think we've just got to find our way, but not lose our identity with it. Brilliant, thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, just want to say about the creativity, which I think is really important about in the players, but also in the coaches and those that succeed in on court in terms of creating winning competitions, they are creative coaches, they've got it. But also those that are engaging with the message out there, that they're, they're finding creative ways, um, particularly in the clubs. The clubs that are succeeding aren't probably stereotypical football clubs that you would think or consider to succeed. It's the smaller clubs that don't have the big budgets, they don't have the financial backing, but actually they find their creative ways 
because they're driven and that's what the exciting things hopefully that will carry on and it will grow and that will capture the imagination and entice more people more clubs where it is football clubs or not it's just more people involved in playing the game which will grow everything so it's great it's great thank you yeah, thanks to Stephen for inviting us today um, and it's good to speak to people about sort of what the EFL does there's a lot that we can still learn from other people about how it applies to clubs well thanks for your contribution Luciana thoughts uh, one last point that links to what uh, gentleman just said just now what his name sorry Shani named that again please uh, yes. Uh, yes. Dennis Dennis, sorry, yeah, Dennis. Dennis thank you is uh, the importance of coach education and that's something we've been talking about. So I'm a coach educator, so I'm a lecturer as my full-time job and in sports coaching. And day to day you see how coaches come to you and actually do what exactly you're saying. A very structured practice is all about the teaching, the coaching, and not about the learning. But actually, if we want better teams, we want better players, women and men and children and everyone, the coaches need to be a support for those players. And actually it's not about what I teach, not about what I coach, but are you actually learning something? So the coach education aspect for me is one of the key things that needs to come alongside coaching and as well. Thank you very much. Jess? Just um, really agree with the, the first two comments. I think um, Mark was right. I think football and futsal have to create their own path, but they're not mutually exclusive. And I think for kids, we should encourage them to do both. And uh, I don't think you'll ever lose a player, a potential player will never not discover they're brilliant at football because it's so accessible for everybody, but other sports, futsal being one, that can miss people, and we're just going to make it accessible for all. And I think just touching on, on Mark's point and, and the, the guy about the coaching, I think sometimes we give ourselves a little bit of a bad rap about everything we do in football's not good, when I disagree with that. I, I think some of the work that goes on in the academies now is brilliant. I think some of the coaching is brilliant. I think that the FA do a, a really good job now in developing and educating coaches. I think that's come a long way in, in the last few years. I think there's been massive gains made. And I know from our football club personally that the guys who go to St George's Park and the guys who go on those coaching education programmes, that's like another world to where it was five, ten years ago. So I think there has been progress and there's always a time lag. So, you know, what was done badly in the past, we might be reaping the rewards of that now. But what is perhaps being done really well now, we won't find out for a little while. So we shouldn't assume everything's bad. I think there's some good stuff going on and, and I think if football clubs like ourselves, I, I agree, we, we're really passionate about it, we're Cambridge United, we're tiny, we're in League Two, not many people listen to us, we've got a little bit of a platform because we're doing something a little bit different in this sport, but it's because we believe in it and we're passionate about it, so if we can try and engage other bigger clubs to do a similar job, then that would be a good thing for us to do as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Jess. Mark, it goes without saying, we really appreciate your partnership on this conference and making it um, happen. Your final thoughts on... But Sal, you've obviously made a, a big commitment to me. Yeah, thank you for that, and, and thanks guys for your, for your um, attendance, thanks for the contributions from, from all the guys who presented, and, and thanks to yourself, Stephen, for setting this up. I think that um, you know, things like this can only help. Right? The question is around where do we go in the future, and, and what do you see for football in the future? There's a few things, uh, I'll just pick Jesus's point up first, and that is that for me, um, you, you've got to be a little bit careful because yes, it is a sport in its own right. Um, and what I see sometimes is like a zealot-like approach to it. Whereas I think that you're not in a strong position because of the strength of football in this country. And a lot of sports have said that. So I think that the, the, the phrase that you use, Mike, is, 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 um, is collaborative. You've got to work with what you've got. You've got to work with football and you've got to You've got to persuade them at the end of the day um, that this is something that's good for football. They can coexist and they can help each other. Uh, certainly the, the people like Jess, myself uh, and other people at football clubs who um, will see this. I think I come back to the point I was trying to make. It's about how you apply your resources. Now, if you're looking to the Premier League to push this, they've got resources, but they've got the priorities. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be sticking them as top of the tree in terms of something I'd be asking for at Christmas. Um, in terms of the FA, um, again, a similar problem moving an organisation like that, which has many priorities, as I know, uh, and, and persuading that this is one, it, it's, it's a big task. It's not an impossible task, it's a big task, which will take some time to do it. 
Um, so I think that the essence of this, and you know, one of the issues for me was uh, when I looked at it, we were resource constrained. And um, you say, well, you immediately look at this and say, well, what is, who's quantified the resources to actually bring this on as a sport? You've got pitches in all over the place and stuff like this, so the same. So I think the industry should look at what's available and work with it. Because uh, you don't necessarily need a, a futsal court that's exactly like ours. There are other ways of doing it, and you've got to be flexible and, and approach that. And ultimately, I, and it pains me to say this, I suspect that what will happen is that it will be irresistible in terms of the agenda for the FA. You know, if I, I put great hope in, in the Americans to live in it, I know in Thailand there's a massive base of, 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 of futsal out there, uh, and, and if we get our way, it will be played all over in Mongolia in the short term and ever all over China in the longer term. And when you see that, and you see the impact of that, and I'll just go back to that one point again. You know, um, I take the emphasis point about age-specific coaching. I don't necessarily agree with it. I think an example of one doesn't necessarily persuade me. Um, and age-specific coaching is all about. Um, and if you look at this. We say to the, to the Chinese, if you want to plant a tree, the best time is 20 years ago, but you might as well start now, because you are where you are, uh, and we are where we are. And, and so I think we've got to accept that, we've got to make have events like this, we've got to look at what's around us, and we've got to be collaborative. We, we, you know, we would, say we, the Futsal community would not win in a fight at King's Football. And so that's just, it, it's, it's, it's a wrong point to, to, to end on, because what you'll see here is the world will take us along at the end of the day. You know, FIFA have got it, and whatever you think about the organisation, um, they've, they've got it now. The UEFA have got it. It will get coverage on the televisions, and so you know, I actually think it, it will come to this country. It will come in a piecemeal way. There'll be Cambridge, there'll be others, there'll be other people, there'll be private contractors, there'll be pressure from UEFA, there'll be pressure, you know, because I, the women's game I think will be a success in itself. We all sat and watched England play football at the tournament and about in two weeks time the Lionesses are coming here so and we're doing that because the FA allowed us to do that to promote the women's game. So I think a bit of patience uh, but be collaborative. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to start to wind things up. We obviously appreciate the sponsorship we have had from Umbro from the Professional Footballers Association and from my Cujo, and uh, I just thought I'm going to come to one of you guys, I don't know whether Diego you want to just say a few words, but very much futsal part of what the business you're trying to build. Um, you know, yes, definitely futsal has been part of my Cujo since the very beginning, actually I said the third club, the fourth club were two futsal clubs. Futsal, futsal represents uh, an incredible niche. Uh, an incredible passion, something I haven't mentioned yesterday, whenever there is futsal match, more or less 30 to 40 percent of the audiences are not coming from the same country where the match is being streamed. This means that there is a huge interest worldwide to watch futsal, and there is nothing available. Uh, that's why this community, it's, it grows globally, and we can definitely see that, that the um, Futsal needs a niche, needs, needs a space also where it can express itself and where the community is interested in Futsal can go to the same point of reference. We would like to build my Cujo around this, this dream. Well, listen, you're already on the way. We appreciate you joining us for the last couple of days. El, some fi a final thought from you on what you've learned over the last couple of days and the direction we're heading in, please. Um, again, I'd like to say thanks to everybody that's, that's here and allowed us the time to um, discuss what we do. Um, the, other, the most important thing that I got out of this is that there are a lot of people around the world <coughs> also fighting the same battle um, and also want to grow the sport and want to take it to the next level and it's, it's really important that we're, we're all together and all helping each other to try and achieve that. So um, thanks again <coughs> to Stephen and fantastic job that you're doing. Um, That's great. It's a big difference so thank you. Thank you, and we really appreciate coming on word from Australia. Dem, I don't know if you want to say a few words, you've been running around looking after us, trying to keep us on track and things. Um, yeah, it's been, been a great couple of days. I think, I think we're at a point in, in the history of Futsal that's it's very exciting, it's, it's an important point. 
Um, I was thinking of a question there, but maybe it's too late for this now. Um, I think we'd probably need to start one. And, and maybe it's one for a future conference. Yeah. Um, and hopefully in a year's time we can be discussing how to take the football professional, professional in the UK. Um, there'll be obviously examples from Braga, Betis, Croatia, the PFL, and hopefully they can give us the insight into how that took the next step to get to that level. And I think that's where we hope for, I think we all want it to go. Uh, we're not there yet, but hopefully that's something we can be discussing in a year's time. And yeah, I just want to say thank you to Stephen for bringing this together. Um, it's been a mad few months, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Pulling this all together, and thanks to Mark for hosting it, Tramia. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Papa, I really enjoyed your talk this morning. Of course, we're all deeply jealous that a La Liga club would get behind Futsal. You have, you have created a template to which we all aspire. I hope, I hope. <clears throat> I think the challenge is um, to give the, the opportunity to kids and young people to play futsal. Uh, I think this is the challenge. But the challenge is become successful if the football club help to do this by Tamara Roberts and to it. Creating facilities and creating the structures and staff and so on where all people can play in futsal in England. Well, thank you for your contribution. <coughs> Mitch, you, you've been around the game for years, for a while. Uh, for a while. Um, it's moving, isn't it? I can feel it in the water. That's what I will take away from this. <coughs> there, there are many people who can feel it starting to fizz and, and getting ready to take off. Yeah, I agree with you. So futsal is growing really well. I would like to wish a lot of success to English Futsal, to be close to your bigger brother, because they will help you in terms of money and uh, organization, many other things. But uh, never forget your soul, that we are different sports. To football, I, I wish in England to produce so many good players, like I remember Kevin Keegan was, and for a while you are missing some kind of player. I believe Futsal could be a tool to, to produce some kind of well, thank you for coming over and spending the last couple of days with us. Antonio, I think what you've achieved is, both in Portugal <coughs> and with Sporting Club Braga is proof that if you have vision and take massive action, things can build quite quickly. Yes, it can be done and it can be done like you just said. Uh, but I would like to start by uh, thanking Stephen and congratulating him for the organization of this event. It was really great, it was great to be here for the past two days, and I really enjoyed it. Of course, there are lo loads of important messages here. Uh, I'd like just to point out two or three. Uh, organizational framework uh, for development of food service is, is important, like we've seen. Uh, education is crucial, sustainability is incredible. But then uh, a, a strong message I take from here is the passion that people really talk when they talk about futsal and what they talk about, what they've done at home and what they did at home. And uh, I really thought I had done a lot in my, for, for my for sport and for my club. But when I hear and I heard uh, people here uh, telling us this experience, I, I don't think I've done enough. So thank you very much. And good luck. Well, that's very humble. Thank you very much. Uh, Keith, uh, I would say to you, that you appear to have the world about to be at your feet with a huge amount of work, but thank you, after all your experience, for being so humble and just rolling your sleeves up and getting down the dirty with us over the last couple of days, because it's been an absolute joy. I, I think it's been an awesome, incredible two days. Uh, for all of us to be in this pathway and to come together from whatever part of the world we come. I'd like to thank all the people that spent money and traveled from all over. Um, because without you, you're like fans, and, and I wish you all the best. Uh, what I'm really excited about is Futsal in England. The history of this country is based upon the intelligence and passion and hard work of its people. And you're, you're right there. I mean, I know how well you do coach and education. I know how well you put ideas together and plans. Obviously, your outdoor is League is great, and it will come together with, with all of you. I commend you both, and Mark, thank you very much for, for being a pioneer uh, for what you're doing here. Luciana, 
for the women. There will be a women national team in England, and I am for sure know that in a short period of time, it will be one of the best teams in the world because of the ability of the women in this country. So on, on behalf of, I guess everyone in my country, on behalf of the PFL, I've been honored, Stephen, to come and finally meet you face to face, to work with these wonderful colleagues, uh, and again, it's been a great honor for me. Thank you. No, thank you very much indeed. Damon, can I ask you to take over that camera, please, because I need to get the man who's holding it now to come across to me and to take this microphone, because uh, we saw that clip a little bit earlier, didn't we? Build it and they will come. This is what you've been working towards for the last few uh, years, and you've got the start that you wanted, your first conference under your belt. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate those words. And, and to all the kind words as well, thank you. I, I, honestly, I've been talking to, as you know, many, many years, Keith, and to everyone as well. Meet Chilton on you for a long time as well, and Eldon, and so many people in the room as well. It's, 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 it's incredible. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of this. And, you know, everything starts small, and everything grows, and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and futsal will get bigger and bigger, and, and it will be tough, and doors will be closed. but. I've had doors close on me loads of times and then try me open their door and then, you know, so I could have just stopped and said no one's interested in it and then I was going to give up but then the door opened and now you're here and then another door and a few people have already had discussions with me today but let's do this again and let's do it somewhere else and, you know, so thank you so much. I don't know what else to say. I'm a little bit overwhelmed so I just uh, hope you've had a great two days and thank you, Mark, and thank you, everybody else. Well, well listen, thank you. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Thanks to all of you who came to Prent Park, thanks for spending the time with us, thanks for contributing, thanks to you for watching online, you have been with us for the very first Futsal Focus, I've still got to read it, Network <laughs> Business Conference. If we do another one, I will try and memorise it, but uh, thanks very much for being with us over the last couple of days. From all of us here, goodbye. <laughs>